an experience with the compassion that God has for whatever it is that you're going through. So this is something um, I think I told my father-in-law that I would that I would speak tonight a few months ago, and it wasn't until last month that my husband and I really just started going through some really tough stuff. And I'm sure that all of you are well aware sometimes you have problems that hit on certain aspects of life, whether it's financial or personal or whatever, but sometimes you go through something that's hitting you on every level of life at the same time. It makes it really hard to hold on to hope. It makes it really hard to hold on to the things that you always thought you had a very sure grasp of in God. Theology seems fleeting sometimes when pressure is applied. That's where James 1 comes from. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So what I want to do is just pray right now. I'm going to just pause for a second, go to Philippians 4, 4, 8. It's something that we've heard before about the things that we're supposed to be you know, Paul is instructing us. These are the things that you think about, but uh, this is the Knox translation, and one of the, the first things he said is, all that rings true, and he goes on to list everything else, but let this be the argument of your thoughts for everything that rings true. So, Father, I just ask you right now that everything that you're trying to convey tonight, that what you are trying to say to every one of these individual people in their individual situations, God, that it rings true and that that become the argument of their thoughts, that you walk through these situations with these people. In Jesus' name. And I also wanted to read out of Psalm 56, 8. This is uh, where David is in a tough spot. He's in a lot of tough spots in the Psalms. He said, you have kept count of my tossings, of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. So that's what I say to you today, that God is for you. Let there be no question in your mind that God is for you. Something my husband wrote, um, it wasn't very long um, before we started going through tough stuff. It's kind of funny, sometimes God gives you a little heads up, but you don't always realize it's a heads up. Uh, he wrote a post on grieving, and I'm going to read a portion of it to you. He said, grieving is a very important thing. Whether it's the death of a person or a dream, a financial loss or a relationship that has radically changed, pushing down those emotions becomes a huge roadblock to returning to joy. The pain expressed in grieving can be so intense it puts you in a fetal position. Too many times in my life I've chosen not to process those emotions, but in that state I couldn't feel the positive emotions either. The first time I ever got rejected, I cried for hours and decided that it wasn't helpful. I discussed this with a pastor friend years later and he said, grieving wasn't the problem. The problem was that you grieved alone. I think so many times, I mean, life is full of ups and downs. Being a follower of Jesus does not insulate you from bad things happening to you. It doesn't mean that we're alone. It doesn't mean that he's not going to overcome through us. It doesn't mean that the promises of God are not true. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to experience hard things. And I think one of the difficulties that's been true in my life is that I want to um, call out for help. I want to cry out to God. I want to, um, I want to really be with him when I know that I didn't do anything wrong and that I'm totally blameless in the situation when I'm a pure victim. I found it much, much harder to ask for God's help when it was, um, when whatever the problem was is something that I had contributed to the cause of. You know, whether it's, um, you know, sometimes the end of a relationship, for example, can be very hard, but if you knew that you shouldn't have been in the relationship to begin with, are you allowed to ask God for help getting you out of it? Are you, are you allowed to cry out to God when you're really in pain and really hurting? 
So um, what I wanted to talk about um, is going to be in Psalm 18. And David was in an incredibly impossible situation in Psalm 18. This is the a song um, that he sings about his deliverance from his enemies and from Saul. And what's happening is he is actually physically surrounded by the enemy. And so what usually happens, I mean, if you look at, at biblical times and the times when David was, um, was walking the earth, singing his psalms, fighting his battles, uh, most, most battles took, took place between kingdoms. And this was a unique situation because David was part of Saul's kingdom and yet he was being pursued by Saul. He was not being defended by any other nation. He had his ragtag band of mighty warriors, God called them. Um, but basically he just had this sort of um, group of people that he collected along the way while he's hiding from Saul. And uh, it starts out, the psalm starts out in this really interesting place. And that is, let's go ahead and read it. Um, I love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my stronghold, my fortress, and my champion. My God, my rock, where I find safety. My shield, my mountain refuge, my strong tower. So the way that battles were typically fought is you, um, you stay in your strong tower. And sometimes a siege would come against you from a foreign nation, and they would come camp around your your strong tower, your castle, your fortress, whatever you want to call it, and they would try to wait you out. And they would cut off your food supply, and they would cut off your water supply, and these sieges could go on for years and years and years. In this case, David is surrounded, but he has no fortress. He is all by himself. There is nothing to protect him. He is all alone. And so the idea of him calling out to God and saying, you are my strength, you are my strong tower, means something. It means something very significant because he, all he has is God. All he has to rely on as his protection is God. And so um, just as a complete side tangent, but it's worth, uh, it's worth noting is um, by the time David actually becomes king and he actually becomes king of Judah and Israel, um, they, they are, um, have a strong tower in Jerusalem. And up until that point, Jerusalem did not belong to Israel. And so Israel uh, had this amazing strong tower in Jerusalem, and it had its own water supply. And it was like a tremendously prophetic thing that God gives to Israel is a, is a strong tower, a fortress with its own water supply. And so now, looking to, to God as our strong tower, because that strong tower is just as relevant to us today as it was for David then, we think about, okay, well, how do we have our own water supply when we're cut off from everything in a siege that might come against us? When circumstances are such that we can, we can look out and see, okay, there's thousands of enemies in front of me, there are all these circumstances that are coming against me, and, and God says, you have rivers of living water flowing out of your belly. You will never be cut off from the water source. These, these things that classically are going to come against you and they're going to seem imposing and they're going to seem daunting and they're going to seem impossible, I have provided for you already. So, um, let's see. God was David's strong tower when he literally didn't have one. So the thing is, is, okay, so we have this strong tower that's provided for us. Are we, the first question is, are we going to go inside? And I think one of those things when, uh, when we feel like we're partly to blame for something is, um, I don't know if, if this is the right way of explaining it, but it's kind of like, well, I made this mess, like, do I really want to put God out by having to have him come down and bail me out, and I don't really know if I want to do this, and I was, I was reading about uh, the prodigal son, it's a very familiar story, and uh, it was in a book by John Sheesby, I think it's called The Father's House, Inside the Father's House, something like that, and he was talking about what the, what the son did after the father put the ring and the robe and the sandals on him. So this is a kid who basically um, said, I want the money from his dad before his dad died. It's, it's almost like, hey dad, I wish you were dead. I just would rather have the money. 
take the money out, go spend the money on riotous living, and then when you get good and, and broke, and you realize that, hey, even the servants of my father's house have this better, have a better life than me, and you come, come home, you're kind of faced with that, oh wow, what did I do to my dad? <laughs> you know, like, wow, I, I really, there's guilt, there's shame, there's condemnation, there's all this, this kind of stuff, in addition to all of the, the situations and horrible experiences that you lived when you're outside of his protection, you've already squandered his inheritance, you have nothing to show for yourself, so you, you minimize yourself to the level that you think maybe he would take me back if I offered to be his hired servant. Your dad treats you as if you were dead and now you're found. And you're so blown away by his generosity, by his grace, that you don't really know what to do. He comes running at you when you're in the distance. I mean, almost tackles you to the ground. He's like shoving his clothes on you. He's like, tears are streaming down his face. He's so happy to see you. You know, he's giving you the best of the best. He's ordering the slaughtered calf. And you know what happens? Your, your brother's mad at you. You still feel bad. So at this point, it's up to you. What are you going to do about it? And John Sheesby was talking about how so many of us, like, when that night rolls around, do you head back to your old room in the main house, or do you go out to the servants' quarters and, and act like, no matter how big of a to-do your dad made, well, you know, I'm still coming back in a lesser position. I, 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 I lost my, my one shot to be a good son. And so... That's what I was thinking about when you have access to this strong tower, but do you go inside? Do you allow God to be your refuge? Do you allow him to be your protection? Do you allow him to meet you in your pain when you're at your lowest? Or would you rather keep him at arm's length and wait until you've had a chance to clean yourself up a little bit and earn your way back into his heart, into his house? And um, for those of you who have heard me speak before, um, it's very, very clear uh, in the Pauline letters that we do not earn our spot in heaven. We do not earn a relationship with God through our own righteousness. Nothing that we do would ever make us good enough to get in. It was Christ and what he did for us that gains us access to abundant life. Amen. And why did he do that? Because he wanted to. Why did he do that? Because he loved you that much. And he doesn't care <laughs> whether it was a situation you got yourself in or something that happened to you that was completely out of your control. He loves you anyway. Um, revisiting Psalm 18, I realized that I had certain blind spots, um, certain bad theology that had kind of woven its way in um, to my life. and. And I didn't realize it was there until enough pressure exerted itself on me that those wrong patterns of thinking started to, to come out. And in, in this psalm, it's really amazing. So David is in this impossible situation, and he's crying out to God, and God hears him from heaven. So it's, it's this, this situation, um, you know, where David is. Let me read some of these. Um, so verse 4 of Psalm 18. When the bonds of death held me fast, destructive torrents overtook me. So I'm going to read this in a bunch of different translations so you really get this sense of David, of where he was, how he was feeling. So I encourage you to just think about whatever situation that you're feeling and the overwhelmingness of it because David's describing this emotional state. So he's talking about cords of death wrapped around me, torrents of perdition dismayed me, Death's breakers closing in on me. The travail of death swept over me. Torrents of destruction flooded upon me. For when the spirit of death wrapped chains around me and terrifying torrents of destruction overwhelmed me, in the message paraphrase, it says, the hangman's noose was tight at my throat. Devil waters rushed over me. He's in a dark spot. I mean, physically speaking, he's going to die today based on what he can see with his eyes. Not only is he going to die, but he bears the responsibility of all the men he's leading. He has the promise of God that he's supposed to be king of this mighty nation. And he is in an impossible military situation. He's surrounded on all sides. There's nothing he can do to get out of it. Um, to continue in verse 5. The snares of death were set to catch me. 
The traps of death sprung upon me. The clutches of the grave laid hold of me. Taking me to death's door, to doom's domain. That was the passion paraphrase. In the message it says, hell's ropes cinched me tight. Death traps barred every exit. So this is a place where he's really feeling like he's, like he's being strangled, like he's being drowned. And it's, it's interesting because a lot of the, the sin references, the trap references, it makes it seem like, like he got tricked into going one way and that was what got him stuck in this impossible situation. Who knows exactly what happened, but the, the references to sin, the references to traps, it made it seem like somehow he's taking some of this personal responsibility onto himself for, for the mess that he's in. Then in anguish of heart, I cried to the Lord. I called for help to my God. He heard me from his temple, and my cry reached his ears. Um, let's see. In the Passion Paraphrase, my sobs came right into your heart, and you turned your face to rescue me. He is crying. He is devastated. And this is kind of where the interesting thing happens. So God is sitting in his throne in heaven, really far away from where the action is happening, down below. And what happens? God answers. God answers. And like, here's where, uh, this is a true messianic psalm. So I'm about to introduce you into a couple of things, but basically what happens, like to sum it up, is God gets off of his throne and is really, really mad, and he comes down to save his kid. And he's not mad at his kid. <laughs> but he's really, really mad. And he comes out of heaven and he goes all the way down and snatches his kid out of the clutches of, of death, of the grave, of all of these different things. And so here's where the bad theology was for me. It's like, oh, okay, so you, you did this for David, who's your king, who you chose, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I just didn't think that he would ever do that for me. You know, I get myself stuck in a situation or, or even if I'm an innocent victim, it's like, I know you love everybody, but I don't think that you would climb out of heaven and swoop down and be really mad on my behalf. And that comes from bad experiences when I was growing up. That comes from, you know, I don't know, uh, existing patterns of low self-esteem that I haven't yet dealt with. It comes from a lot of places that are, that are not true because the, the theology I profess to believe every day is that God loves me, God loves me, God loves me. And sometimes in these situations, when the pressure applies, you realize, oh, I've been believing this lie. But it was really like, when I'm facing something impossible, do I believe that God cares about me enough to get off of his throne in heaven and come down for me? So I want you to take a moment and really... Like, ask yourself the question, do you believe that he cares about you that much? Look at your situation, look at your impossibility. Does he love me as much as you love David? And <laughs> then I realized um, that he's actually already done that for me. And he's actually already done that for you. And how is that possible? Well, this is a messianic psalm. So I'm going to take you through. Um, so when we go right after where I was talking to you about where, um, you know, you, you cry out and God turns his, his face to rescue you. Uh, verse, the very next uh, verse, verse 7, the earth heaved and quaked. The foundations of the mountains shook. They heaved because he was angry. So this is a parallel to what happens when Jesus died on the cross. In Matthew 27, where the earth is literally shaking. Um, the next verse, um, smoke rose from his nostrils, devouring fire came out of his mouth, glowing coals and searing heat. So I want you to just like keep your ears open to all of this anger. And the anger is not being poured out on David. The anger is being poured out that my son was was stuck in this situation, he was trapped. I'm gonna get off my throne and help him. So he swept the skies aside as he descended. So it's like 
he was doing a bunch of stuff in heaven, and he's so distracted by the peril that his son's in that he just sweeps everything off of his desk and dives down, you know, rips the skies apart. Um, and then he talks about thick darkness lay under his feet. Again, Matthew 27, the sky turned as black as night. So this is a parallel to God coming off of his throne and entering David in his low death choking you out kind of situation. So that's exactly what's happening with us in a more general sense where we were sin, we were slaves to sin and death. We were dead in our trespasses. So that's where we were. We were in an impossible situation and God came down in the form of Jesus, in the form of man and entered into our pain with us for the purpose of removing us from it. So, let's see. I'm going to skip over a little bit. But, I mean, it's like there's all kinds of, of the darkness references, the anger references. There's a, a lot of things that we could get into. You okay, little man? The Lord thundered from heaven. The voice of the Most High spoke out. He loosed his arrows and he sped them far and wide. He shot forth lightning shafts and sent them echoing. See how they run and scatter in fear. So this is what's happening. And this is the verse I want to focus on is verse 16. He reached down from the height and took me. He drew me out of mighty waters. And I'm going to read it in a couple more translations. He reached from on high, pulled me out of the many waters, snatched me up, drew me to himself took me from the depths of despair, but me he caught, reached all the way from sky to sea, he pulled me out. So this is a very strong message. He is not leaving you where you are. He's not leaving you where you are. All you had to do was cry out and he was there. No matter how many other things he was doing, you know, Mr. I, I can see all, know all, do. You know, he has all these things going on, all these balls in the air, but none of them are more important than you in your despair. Um, this is verse 17. He rescued me from my enemies, strong as they were, from my foes when they grew too powerful for me. Uh, in the message paraphrase, out of that ocean, he took me out of that ocean of hate, that enemy chaos, the void in which I was drowning. Now, I just want to pause there. How many of you have ever, have ever felt the ocean of hate and that enemy chaos, where your mind is just swimming with all of those thoughts and all of those, like, this is bad, that's going to happen, and this will cause this, and this will cause this, and your mind is spinning. It's like there's so many thoughts going on in your mind. There's no peace. There's no peace. You don't know which way is up. You're like the waters of despair just throwing you around. Um, it just feels sometimes like situationally, it's like everything happens at the same time. Bad stuff seems to always happen like one after the other after the other. It's like they wait till you're down and then they just start kicking you. And why does that happen? You know, it's um, life isn't always fair, but it's like in verse 18. Uh, David's talking, they confronted me in the hour of my peril. They came at me on the, my day of disaster. Um, the Passion Paraphrase, when I was at my weakest, my enemies attacked, but the Lord held on to me. Um, and what I want to want to do is like take you back to that place, you know? So what's, what's going on in the New Covenant then? Uh, Romans, Romans 5, 20 through 21. So it's like, the enemy waits till you're at your lowest, and then he strikes. He kicks you while you're down. And if you look here uh, in verse 20 and 21, as our, the law intervened only to amplify our fault. But as our fault was amplified, grace has been more amply bestowed than ever, that so where guilt held its reign of death, justifying grace should reign instead to bring us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus waited until sin was at its strongest, when it's really lashing out at you, to enter into the picture so that he can show his superabounding grace. Where sin abounds, grace superabounds. Where, <laughs> you know, where darkness is, he brings us out of darkness into his glorious light. 
So that's that's kind of what's what's happening there. So this is somewhere I wanted to stay for a little while. This is verse 19. Um, this is kind of where the the messianic part of the psalm is really interesting. So it's like if this psalm is really about Jesus coming as Savior. This is where he brings us out of where we were and into where he is. This is where we're, this is kind of the, the place where we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So, he brought me out into an open place. So you go from being choked out by death, you know, having all the, the, the hangman's noose around your throat, feeling like there's no way out, like every last breath is being, you know, taken from you. And you, you are brought out into an open place. And why is that? He rescued me because he delighted in me. So I want to go into this for a, for a little bit. So I want to read a couple translations. And it's like, you go from being confined. It, you're almost claustrophobic with all of the stuff that's pressing in on you on all sides. That's how you that's how you feel, but that's also true in a factual sense about the, cir the circumstances. So not to say that that it's not real, it is real, but God's reality is just bigger. Amen. And so um, one translation says he brought me out to a wide open space, set me free for his pleasure I was. He freed me, set me at large. He rescued me because he loves me. He led me out to a spacious place. He released me out of affection for me. His love broke open the way, and he brought me into a beautiful, broad place. He rescued me because his delight is in me. He stood me up on a wide open field. I stood there saved, surprised to be loved. So... <clears throat> I want you to do something for me. Stand up. We're gonna we're gonna do a little exercise. I want you to do a little visual. Now I'm gonna um, imagine the biggest circumstances that are coming against you right now. The most overwhelming thoughts. You know, just allow yourself to really go there. God, I just ask that you that you soften our hearts. That you just really um, let us enter into a space where we know that we're safe. Where we can truly tap into what we've been dealing with, what we've been feeling. And we can receive your affection for us. So I want you to feel what you've been feeling. I want you to think about what you've been going through and about the impossibility of your situation. Whether you feel like that bank balance from month to month is just getting bleaker and bleaker and you've run out of all of your options. It's like, God, how are you going to be my strong tower? There's, there's nowhere for me to run. There's nowhere for me to go. No backup plan. So from that place, I want you to start reaching out your hands physically and start reaching out past those circumstances because you exist in a realm where you are free. You exist inside of his faithfulness. So I want you to push past that with your hand and realize that in this realm, you have freedom to move. You exist in a wide open space. You have freedom to breathe. You're not being pressed in. You can breathe this fresh air in this realm of, of heavenly places. This is where you live. This is where you're seated with Christ. This is your space. And really, like, I mean, stretch out. Lift your hands up. Lift your hands out. Feel this. Feel the freedom. This exists inside of his faithfulness. Inside of his faithfulness. This is his promise for you. This is his place for you. You have a place. This is your strong tower inside of him. You can think about this so many ways. This is, the, this is the armor of God that you live inside of. This is his faithfulness that you live inside of. He is the rock underneath your feet, the bedrock. There's no quicksand here. You are safe. You are secure. You have 
freedom to stretch, freedom to move, freedom to breathe, freedom to dream again. This is the place where hope is your air. You breathe in hope and you exhale dreams. And guess what? Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled, a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. These, this is where the trees grow. This is where the trees grow. So um, me, let me jump over just for a second. Um, I want to show you two, um, two verses side by side, speaking of trees. So uh, Romans 12, 15 is talking about weep with those who weep. And this is a really important thing because a lot of times sadness, you know, all of these dark things, they make us feel uncomfortable. And so we jump into the transformational aspects of God without bothering to stop and feel with people what they're going through. And what does Paul tell us to do? Weep with those who weep. And you know, you know, it's, it's interesting because a lot of what he's saying is um, enter into this new creation reality where Christ lives in you. Guess what Christ did? Guess what he did? He jumped into our mess with us. He didn't he didn't just, you know, put on a glove and reach way down and try to, like, get us out and get the least a bit, you know, a bit of dirt and contamination on him and try to clean us off and make us presentable. No. He dived into our mess fully. Fully God, fully man in our mess, feeling every sin consequence, feeling every victimization. He entered into the weight of oppressor and oppressed. He went into the yuckiest stuff with us and he stayed there until he dealt with all of it. And at that point, he pulled us out with him. So you're talking about we were crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20, so that we could be raised with Christ. The raised with Christ happened after the crucified with Christ. So what you're looking at now is jump to Isaiah 61.3, to, um, this is about providing for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So guess what? You are the display of his splendor. You living in the wide open spaces, breathing the air of heaven, being able to dream again, turning into these oaks of righteousness, producing more hope oxygen with your trees of righteousness. I mean, this is the cycle that we live in, but it happens after weeping with those who weep. It happens after we stop trying to keep God at an arm's length and we really let him enter his pain with us because guess what? He doesn't want you to be alone. Amen. He never wants you to be alone. He's been there with you every step. Every step of the way. When it feels like nobody's on your side, he's there. There is, um, I'm going to read something out of uh, Philippians 3. And I'm going to read it in a very strange translation. It's called, The Gospel Cannot Be Chained. I realize that in Philippians, uh, Paul's in prison. And he's kind of, I mean, this is the perfect opportunity, right, to face his own mortality. You're in prison. You're very likely going to be martyred for Christ at some point. Uh, you're writing to a, a group of people that you care about, like they're your family. You want them to succeed. You want them to thrive. You're, you're imparting maybe your last words to them. And he's talking about... He's talking about knowing Jesus. That's why I asked Mark to sing that song, Knowing Jesus. There is no greater thing. And he's talking about what he's come out of. And so I consider the religious zeal I once had a loss. I could even go so far as to say I consider it rubbish. Even if others around would gladly consider it to their credit, I consider it a loss. I think this way because I know God has offered me 
a far greater reality. So, so Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. So he was like the best Hebrew kid around. He came from the right, you know, the right side of the tracks, the right school, had all the money, had all the, the position, was even good looking. You know, he had all of the stuff that would make him um, perform well. And, you know, if there was one person that was going to be really, really close to complying with all the stuff of the law, it would be Paul. Now, obviously, nobody could, but he really got close. I mean, there is a lot for him to brag about. And right now, he has Christ, but he's sitting there in chains, in the dirt, not knowing if he's going to be killed. And this is what he's talking about. He says that I have a far greater reality now. I consider all of it, all of that other stuff is a loss. It's, it's a waste. It's trash to me. I don't want any part of it. Now, why is that? The reality that Christ is in me and the opportunity to know him as a savior, a friend, and a brother, to be one with him in perfect love and acceptance apart from any religious performance or self-imposed requirements. It means that in this reality, you never have to wonder if he's still gonna love you if you have a bad day. It doesn't matter um, if you read your Bible that morning, he's still going to come through. It doesn't matter if you yelled at the dog or yelled at your kids or did any of that stuff. I long to know him more and I desire to see myself in him. So he is looking at Christ so closely and about how Christ pulled Paul's suffering into himself when he died on the cross. And he's wanting to relate to Christ in that way. And I mean, it's a deep passage, and we're not going to get sucked in too much um, because we don't have time. But I want to see myself in the mirror of his perfection, not in the mirror of religious obligations that can only reflect my poor attempts of earning a right standing before God. Now, this is a guy who did fantastic on that. <laughs> You know, and he would say, oh, I would, I would totally take this any day. Take this sitting in prison any day because I get to see his perfection shining out of my face when I look in the mirror. Amen. I get to have Christ inside of me, those eyes looking back in the me at the mirror. They're, they're Christ. I get to have his perfection. The mirror of Christ allows me to see the truth that my right standing before God is by faith in all that Christ has accomplished on my behalf. I want to know Christ, and this is exactly what God offers us freely as a gift to all who freely receive it, the gift to know him. Like you, I've taken hold of this great blessing and simply refused to trade it in for knowing merely a religious formula. I desire to know Christ and grow in my understanding of just how powerful his resurrection truly was and how the ongoing effects of that glorious moment continues to impact my life and the lives of all mankind. He is talking about knowing Christ in a relational sense. It means all of a sudden that life is not a destination, it's a journey. Knowing a person is never going to happen completely, no matter how many how many hours, how many decades you spend with that person. I'm never going to know my husband completely, even after living an entire lifetime with him. It's an ongoing adventure of you getting to know, like, how is he going to respond in this situation? How is he going to love me in 10 years when I get older? How is, how is our love going to get passed on in this way? Or what happens when this fun thing happens? Or what happens when this other thing happens? Your relationship is constantly getting more complex. The love is getting deeper. It's, and so... So what he's saying is, if the greatest gift is to know God, then I get to know him differently in every situation that I go through. So in his situation in prison, he's knowing Jesus in a way that he never knew him before. And like, I just want to just small caveat. It doesn't mean that you should never speak against a circumstance or pray to get taken out of it. I'm not saying this at all. Paul knew his spiritual authority in Christ, but he was temporarily, for the moment, stuck in prison. So I, I don't mean to, to discourage you from, from prayer or just accept every bad thing that comes against you as something that you need to take. That's not what I mean at all. But 
so, so Paul is talking about the mirror of Christ's perfection. He's seeing Christ in him. And so I want to jump to Colossians 1.22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. New Living Translation says without a single fault. English Standard Version says above reproach. New American Standard says you are holy and blameless. King James, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So we get, the, we get the thing, we get the, the gist of it. Okay, so we're blameless. God made us blameless. We get to look in this mirror of Christ and see his perfection shining through us. So now, jump back to Psalm 18, verse 20. What does David say? This is a messianic psalm, understand. David says, The Lord rewarded me as my righteousness deserved. My hands were clean. Now, do we know David to be one with perfectly clean hands? Maybe not. <laughs> uh, what else? Uh, a different translation says, As my hands are pure, so he repays me. Now, if we're looking at David in the flesh, David, David, uh, his hands are not pure. So if you were saying this, as my hands are pure, so he repays me, then it seems like the psalm would have a different ending. Maybe God wouldn't have come down from heaven. Because if it was based on what David was able to do, on David's righteousness, on David's ability to comply with the law, things wouldn't have worked out the way that they did. So, um, let's see. Verse 21. So he goes on like this for six verses, just talking about how righteous he is, and how blameless he is, and how he, he, he's complied with everything, right? Um, verse 21, for I have followed the ways of the Lord and have not turned wickedly from my God. Verse 22, all his laws are before my eyes. I have not failed to follow his decrees. Verse 23, in his sight I was blameless and kept myself from willful sin. Verse 24, the Lord requited me as my righteousness deserved and the purity of my life in his eyes. So what are we to make of this passage of six different verses of David just boasting in his righteousness and his blamelessness in God's sight. Well, I would propose to you that this is a messianic psalm, that David is tapping into what Paul was talking about, looking into the mirror of Christ's perfection. In Psalm 18, Christ came down into, into David's mess saved him from it, elevated him to a place that was open and wide and expansive, this heavenly realm. And now he takes on Christ's perfection. And I would propose to you, there's a couple of verses later where it's talking about how God will save the humble and oppose the proud. David is, is he's demonstrating the greatest of all humility. He's accepting something that God told him just because God told him. Why are we able to say that we are righteous and blameless? Because God said so. Amen. You know, how prideful to say, no, God, you can't save me because I'm not blameless. Yes, you are. Who defines us but our Creator? Who gets to save us but the one who breathed his very life into us? He makes the rules. He satisfied the requirements. And he calls us blameless. Amen. Um, in verse 24, when he says, The Lord requited me as my righteousness, righteousness deserved. 1 Corinthians 1.30 Christ himself is our righteousness. This is such a cool thing to revisit the Psalms with a new covenant understanding of what's happening. I'm going to jump to verse 28. Yahweh, you yourself are my lamp. My God lights up my darkness. Amen. Notice it's not just darkness, it's my darkness. Again, it doesn't matter what situation you're in. It doesn't matter even if you are completely responsible for getting you there. 
God himself is your salvation. God himself is your lamp. God himself is your light. And he will bring you out of your darkness into his light. That's the exchange. And then we see in verse 29, it starts a whole other uh, section of, um, of verses where you can see David doing the impossible because he has Christ the overcomer inside of him. With your help, I leap over a bank. With God's aid, I spring over a wall. I'm going to read a couple other translations. For through you, I rush at a barrier. Through my God, I can vault a wall. All of a sudden, he is able to get out of this impossible situation. And this, to me, is so fascinating. Um, I'm going to switch thoughts for a second. So Psalm 23, in one of my, fan, like, my favorite translations. So you know Psalm 23. My husband saying it. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, right? If you jump, if you jump down to the part where it's talking about your rod and your staff, they give me comfort. Well, in the Moffat translation, your rod and your staff give me courage. So, what is a rod and a staff to a sheep? Uh, well, typically, it's a tool that a shepherd uses to beat off, you know, intruders, bears, wolves, things. It's it's something to protect the sheep. And so there's a, a sense of comfort that you're protected, but there's also this hint of courage that when God is your uh, protection, that you can suddenly step out in ways that you couldn't before. So God is not the kind of God who, who bails us out of every situation just so that we can sit on our hands. He put his spirit in us, he is constantly saying over and over and over, fear not, fear not, fear not. He wants you to fear not so you realize who's inside of you, that he put the overcomer inside of you, that the victory is already inside of you so that you can vault over a wall. Amen. There may be very real walls in front of you, but you can run at a barrier. It's like playing chicken. You know, you know that when God tells you to go, that when he gives you that protection, that backing, that you can do it. You can do the impossible. You've allowed him to be with you, to feel your pain, to be where you are, and allowed that comfort to transform itself into courage. So if you're not at that place of courage, go back to the place of comfort. Keep receiving that comfort until it transforms into courage inside of you. Allow him to be with you at your darkest place. Allow him to be with you, to minister to you in the deepest hurts. In the New Jerusalem Bible, I love this part. With you, I storm the rampart. With my God, I can scale any wall. It's not just a single wall, it's any wall. Through you, I can pursue a raiding party. With you as my strength, I can crush an enemy horde advancing through every stronghold that stands in front of me. And I'm going to end on verse 30. This is in the Harrison translation, Psalm 18. The divine plan is perfect. The promise of the Lord is assured. He provides a refuge for all who would shelter in him. So I just want to bring this to a close. And as we see how David's transition from being completely outnumbered, completely surrounded, he starts off saying, my God, you're my strength, you're my strong tower. And he, he talks about in verse 30, the divine plan is perfect. The promise of the Lord is assured. I can tell you that God's plan for your life is perfect. And his promises to you are assured.